Hi, so we're back. So as a prelude to uh, discussing uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, which we've really seen in, in an overall guise, what we did was we uh, did a few things with, with regard to streamlines and Bernoulli constant and vorticity and things like this. So I figured I would recap things a little bit before moving on. We kind of stopped at vorticity and uh, what we're going to do next is uh, talk about circulation and how this is a quantity that's conserved. And then we will talk about an, a very interesting effect called the Magnus effect. So, but before that, I figured we would, we would do a very quick recap of what we've done so far, especially uh, during the last lecture or two. Yeah? So what we first said was that if we are talking about an irrotational and incompressible and of course inviscid flow in this case the velocity and uh, for now let us specify let us specialize to 2d flows the velocity can be uh, um, expressed uh, as a the gradient of a scalar velocity potential and we can also express uh, if, especially for, uh, for for 2d flows we can also express the velocity um, uh, since it's 2d i'll explicit, explicitly write this as xy as uh, the curl of something called a, a stream function. So this is the potential, this thing, and this thing is called the stream function. So if all these conditions, irrotationality, incompressibility, inviscid, and 2D you know, uh, all these conditions are satisfied and they very frequently are, both these, uh, both these hold, okay? And in which case, uh, it turns out very interestingly that also, okay, in other words, both phi and psi are solutions to the Laplace equation. Okay, both of these. What's more, these are orthogonal. In other words, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the potential lines and the stream lines are orthogonal, very much like electrostatics, okay? Uh, so this is one thing we said. And what is more, as a, a consequence of this, it's as though as though ux and uy are components of a single complex variable. And this, this property enables us to make um, uh, to, to, to apply the theory of uh, complex variables, uh, you don't have to solve for ux and uy separately and th this simplifies li um, life a lot. And this comes from the cauchy riemann conditions which is essentially this. Okay, so this is something that we said and we showed that as a result of this, as an example, uh, we uh, uh, looked at the problem of uh, you know, a smooth sphere and velocity streamlines uh, around the smooth sphere, which would look something like this. We've, set, we've drawn these and, and the velocity streamlines very far away would simply be undisturbed as though the sphere was not there. 
and uh, okay, so this is for inviscid fluids and, and, and uh, so uh, applying the appropriate boundary conditions which is that the normal, normal component of velocity here uh, on the surface of the sphere is equal to 0 and uh, uh, the tangential component of velocity uh, very far away from the sphere is undisturbed. It is what it would have been in the absence um, you know, of, of, of the sphere and so we need two, two boundary conditions in order to solve for either this or this. Right, so there's a two, second order differential equations. You need uh, you need two boundary conditions, and these are the two boundary conditions. And it turns out that um, you know uh, the solution uh, is 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 something like this. Um, um, some some like so uh, plus u a square over r square, where a is the radius of the sphere. plus, right? So, this is written in polar coordinates and, and, and there is a little bit of mixing here between coordinates, but you understand what we are talking about. This is really x is really r cosine theta uh, and so, this solution which is uh, essentially which we can simply write down knowing the solution to, to uh, this in, 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 in uh, uh, polar coordinates which is well known and applying the two boundary conditions that we talked about you can immediately write down the solution. One emphasize, so this is an example of how you know how uh, these are very useful. Uh, you can immediately write down the solutions to these from very well known solutions and um, I want to emphasize that this is really only an exterior solution not the interior one. Uh, the interior uh, solution, we do, in, interior to the sphere. In any case, we are not interested in, so we are only interested in the exterior solution, but just want to emphasize that, right. So, the other important, the very other very important point we, we discussed uh, was the Bernoulli constant, right. So, the Bernoulli constant is essentially, how should I say this, is essentially an energy equation, okay. So, we start with um, the Euler equation, which if you remember, it's a momentum equation. In other words, it's f equals m a in the absence of viscosity. Okay, so you write down an m a on the left hand side, and the f on the right hand side has to be due to pressure gradients. In other words, a gradient of p or due to body forces. These are only two things possible. So, writing it down uh, exactly in that spirit, uh, the Euler equation is, which is the momentum equation for inviscid fluids, and you should ask yourself, the moment I, you see a partial u partial t, you should know that we are writing this down in the lab frame, in the Eulerian frame. So, this would be uh, m a and the f would be gradient of a scalar pressure plus any possible body forces. which we uh, will assume that uh, this can be written as uh, uh, minus phi or mind you this phi is different from the phi we talked about earlier. This is the gravitational potential not the velocity potential, okay. So, if we can write this down and, and, and do, some, do a little bit of trickery with this and you integrate over a streamline. So, this is what we do. So, mind you this is uh, well this is f or that is f either way the, I mean, the way it is written here this is m a and that is f, but what you are really doing is right this is what you are doing and what do you get when you integrate force over distance you get work energy one of these things. So, that is exactly what you get. You get a quantity that is energy per uh, gram okay? and it turns out that the result of, of this integration is this quantity. I write this down again just to emphasize how important it is. And I want to write this along a streamline. Okay? We get 
this quantity, we, we get this, this particular property which is half u squared plus, let me write this down technically correctly, but you know I just want to emphasize that many times people just write this as p over rho. We get this very important result, yeah, which is the Bernoulli constant. the Bernoulli constant. So, so, this is essentially the Bernoulli constant right here. Just to remind you, the phi is not the velocity potential, it is the gravitational potential. So, let us go back to this slide here, right here. See, it is it's, it's this. Okay. So, this you get this by integrating, you arrive at this result by integrating the f along a streamline and, and you get the Bernoulli constant and there are many interesting. So, uh, yeah. So, the other thing is this is constant along a streamline. It is one constant along one streamline, it is another constant along another streamline. So, I want to emphasize that and this uh, enabled us to, to uh, look at some, some uh, nifty things such as uh, the following, uh, the water out of an orifice like so right? You followed a streamline, you followed one streamline all the way like this, right? And made use of the fact that one half u squared plus p over rho uh, plus phi equals constant, right? You made use of the fact of this fact and the fact that p does not vary much between here and here, yeah? And the, uh, and, 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 uh, um, uh, said that uh, you know uh, phi is essentially uh, g times h uh, where where uh, h is the is the height and this enabled us to uh, to uh, to figure out that figure out the well known result that the velocity of the fluid flowing out is uh, square root of 2gh this is one thing the other thing we we f we did was and i I'll, I'll say this very briefly uh, we, we considered an airfoil that looks somewhat like this. It is essentially a section of an airplane wing and uh, by considering one streamline that goes all the way, all the way across the airfoil yeah, and uh, knowing that the Bernoulli constant is, is, is constant all along the streamline and the fact that the airfoil is designed such again since, this, since the airline, the, 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 the uh, airfoil is very, very thin, phi is pretty much the same above and below. Yeah? But uh, unlike, unlike this situation, the airfoil is designed in such a way, in other words, the, the, air, the, the airfoil is cupped like so, so, such that the velocity here is lower than the velocity up here. As a result, in order for this quantity be, to be conserved, the pressure here, the pressure at the bottom, uh, P bottom and p above, the p bottom is greater than the p above. As a result of which, you get a net upward force. This is a very, very simplistic, very elementary, um, uh, you know, explanation for why there would be a lift on an air wing, uh, on an air, airplane wing, a properly designed airplane wing, one which ensures that the velocity at the bottom of the wing, the velocity of air at the bottom of the wing is lower than that on the top of the wing. If that is the case, then the, uh, you know, uh, going by the Bernoulli constant, the, the pressure at the bottom will be larger than the pressure above and therefore the wing experiences an upward lift. Right. So, this is the other thing we, we discussed. And finally, we came to uh, the concept of vorticity. Okay, which we know is a curl of u. It, it measures the rotationality. And as we have discussed several times before, um, really um, it is only in a viscous flow that you expect the flow to be rotational. Okay, and this brings us to so I mean, just this is enough to uh, sort of anticipate one of the results uh, that's coming up very soon, which is that there's there's an analogous uh, th th there's a closely related quantity called circulation, and this quantity is conserved in, in an inviscid flow. 
if there's no viscosity in the flow, if for whatever reason there's a, there's a, there's a rotation, if for whatever reason there's a circulation in the flow, uh, it's conserved. It does not change. There's no scope for generation or uh, suppression of vorticity in an inviscid flow. Okay? So what we sort of uh, did was again we started with the uh, Euler equation. again written down in the lab frame um, and now we are simply writing this down. This is essentially your G as, as uh, in the previous example and we took a curl of the entire equation. Okay? And then you take curl on both sides. That's what we do. Okay. So, take curl of everything and assume that the fluid is barotropic. In other words, the pressure straightforward function of you know the density. In this case it turns out that this one and this one are parallel and that leads to a very important simplification and uh, that will uh, lead us to, uh, to uh, uh, equation uh, to a dynamical equation for the vorticity. which is, I really should be putting a vector sign on top of this, uh, is equal to So, this is an equation, although there is a u here which is sort of the uncurl of omega, but still uh, this is really a dynamical equation for vorticity in, the, in, in that it relates the time derivative of the vorticity with space derivatives of the vorticity. So, you, you start out with a certain distribution of vorticity in the flow for whatever reason and this equation gives you with proper boundary conditions. Of course, this, this equation completely tells you how the vorticity is going to behave as time progresses. Right? And, and, and what is more, you specify the, di and, and since this is all of this, uh, you know, is, is for incompressible fluids, in other words, okay. So, that already specifies the divergence of the flow and this specifies the curl of the flow because omega is, is the curl of u. Specifying both the divergence and the curl of a vector field completely specifies it for certain you know for well behaved fields which die off nicely at infinity and or if you are not willing to consider boundary conditions at infinity, you have to specify both these equations on, on the boundary subject to those caveats. It is a well known fact that specifying the curl and, di and divergence of a well behaved uh, vector field specifies it completely. So, it is in that sense that we say that the entire velocity dynamics is completely specified by uh, this equation, by the dynamical equation for vorticity. And from here on, we will discuss uh, what is called the Kelvin's Kelvin vorticity theorem, which essentially says that th there is this quantity that we will specify, which is called K, which is the circulation. And this theorem essentially says that in an incompressible inviscid flow, the circulation K is conserved. If for whatever reason there is a circulation in the flow, it remains as it is. 
if and if there's no circulation in the flow, you cannot generate circulation. Okay, so so uh, this is essentially what Kelvin's vorticity's theorem tells you. And we will consider that when uh, uh, we meet next. Okay, so that's it for now, and thank you. <laughs>